My name is Dikaios Anagnost. Dikaios really isn't a name. It's a Greek word for righteousness. When I was a kid, no one could pronounce it. So when I went to first grade, my teacher said, I'm going to call you Dick for short. So I went, quickly went home to my mother and I said, Mom, they want to call me Dick for short. And she said, that's a good idea. Why don't you introduce yourself that way? You can say you're Dikaios, Dick for short, Anagnost. Well, not having a middle name and going to first grade, I became Dick Short Anagnost real fast. <laughs> she must still be up there laughing at me somehow. I have to make an admission right up front. I'm definitely the lowest head on the intellectual totem pole here today, so you'll have to forgive me. Sai, I love octopus too. I got a great recipe. When I was first asked to take part in a TED Talk, I always thought I was going to City Hall to talk to the mayor of Manchester, Ted Gatsis. <laughs> then they told me the topic was mindset. I was particularly happy someone was going to allow me to talk for 20 minutes about our private label shampoo produced by a hair care company. The truth is, though, 20 minutes with a microphone and an audience, I could not resist the temptation to bore you to death. The first thing I did in preparation for today was to find out exactly what mindset meant. So I immediately had my administrative assistant go to the internet <laughs> and look up the definition. She came back with a few. If you haven't judged already, I'm technologically handicapped. I have a piece of paper, I have the clicker for the television, and I still have a telephone that does this. So we went through the definitions, and we have some really good sources. The World English Dictionary, Merriam-Webster says a particular way of thinking, the Freedom Dictionary, and I didn't like any of them. So we decided to make up our own. Darcy, my admin, said, it's the will to do those things others are unwilling to do. Dick said, to have the intestinal fortitude to ask the dumbest possible question to solve the most complex problem and not give a shit what anybody thinks about it. <laughs> Mindset is really what you make of it. Is the glass half full or half empty? Does it really matter? Both will have obstacles. What's the goal? Where's the end game? If it's half full, are we trying to fill it? If it's half empty, are we trying to empty it? Those are the questions we ask in business. Some people overcome these obstacles by throwing money at them. Well, that's great if you got a lot of it. Like, let's hire the fire department with their super-duper pumper truck. They'll fill a glass fast. And the alternative, let's hire the wrecking company that has a wrecking ball They'll come and make short work of that glass. If you don't have a lot of money, it's an invitation to do more with less. A challenge to challenge the conventional answer to make sure you have the best solution. List all of your options, not just those that are socially acceptable or politically acceptable, and vet them thoroughly. Do not settle for, this is the best way. Ask why it's the best way. Don't settle for, this is how we've always done it. I get that crap all the time. I get it from architects, engineers, long-term employees, senior managers, and my answer is always the same. Okay, so what? Most importantly, the secret to my success is the utilization of smart people to help you. They should not be held to the old standards and mindsets you should set and create your own. You have to be organized to succeed, the more organized you are, the easier it is to ask the dumb questions and track the intelligent answers. Read everything, ask questions, challenge it. Bring out the, bringing out the best in people, however, is the real key, though. The dumber the question, the more significant the change can be. We have our company's weekly senior staff partners meetings, and rest assured, I'm the dumbest person in the room. We have a trucking company, and when presented with our first cartage agreement, I was really confused. I thought cartage was a city conquered by Alexander the Great in North Africa. We formed our first construction company, and I started doing site inspections. Well, I'm not only technologically handicapped, my wife is the plumber, my wife is the electrician, she can change the light bulb, I can't do any of those things. So when I walked on site, the construction workers were ordered to hide the keys to the bulldozers and to put all the tools away so I didn't hurt anybody. Can't you see me drag racing in a D8 bulldozer? Or better than that, target shooting with a nail gun? We're in the Harley-Davidson business, if you haven't noticed. I can barely start one. I know where to put the gas in, and I like it when they go vroom, vroom. Actually, Harleys really don't go vroom, vroom. They go more like potato, 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 potato. 
I don't know anything else about them, but we're constantly in the top performers across the country. I guess it's because of the walking billboard that's always around every day. We have 68 Dunkin' Donuts. I don't drink coffee or eat donuts, but I sure look like I do. <laughs> We're one of the fastest growing organizations in the Duncan's family and won the developer and operator of the year for 2012. There are really smart people out there who have great talent and can provide you with great solutions and ideas, but you know what? They're not challenged. It's the mindset. It's the mindset of you and all of the people around you. I have the brightest construction partners. I have the best automotive guy in the business at Harley. I have the top performing Duncan guys. So you ask, what do I do? I ask the dumb questions and put them in the right mindset to excel. Actually, I'm pretty good at collecting the money, too. In my mindset, there's always opportunity, even in adversity. The biggest challenges will be your biggest successes. The more obstacles there are to overcome, the less likely someone else is going to try and do it. These are great opportunities. What about risk, someone says? Well, you control risk with knowledge. You've all heard the cliche, the higher, ri the higher the risk, the higher the reward. Well, due diligence is the pursuit of knowledge, coupled with the discipline to look under every rock for every shred of information about what you're endeavoring to do. Due diligence is not a process. It's a mindset. The more information you have about what you're attempting to do, the more calculated the risks become and the better odds for success. As an entrepreneur, you identify a need in the market and then deliver. Let me share with you a personal example of how mindset can create change. This is an old brewery turned slaughterhouse meatpacking plant on a contaminated piece of land in Manchester along the Merrimack River. We're now going to show you the present. It is now a 268,000 square foot state-of-the-art ambulatory care center that contains everything from an urgent care clinic to an ambulatory surgical center. As you can imagine, just dealing with the contaminated piece of property presented thousands of challenges. Never mind its topography, the fact that it was located along a railroad line. We started with our conventional mindset at $81 million. Then I started asking the dumb questions of the smart people. And we quickly moved into an innovative mindset. For example, the parking garage, which is the largest, largest parking, privately owned parking garage in the state of New Hampshire, was put into a hole to make up 50 feet of grade change between the railroad tracks and the building pad. You know what else it did for us? Think about a surgery center located next to a freight train track. It acted as a buffer between our building and the trains, which got us far enough away to eliminate the sound and vibration. Imagine a surgeon in the surgery center about ready to cut you open for your penile enlargement implant and a freight train rumbles by. Oops! Instant sex change operation. You know, I just thought of something. I don't know if there are any lawyers in the room, but I'm wondering if the medical malpractice carrier can subrogate against the railroad. You ask how it built, got built so quickly. Conventional mindset said two years. We built it in 14 months. Well, another cliche is time is money. So we went to the Iron Workers Union and sometimes unions can be inflexible, but the Iron Workers Union was great. We suggested to them a 410 schedule, four days on, 10 hour days, and four days off, and if they would supply us two crews. The guys at the, at the union hall thought it was great. They got to work four days and then take four off. We thought it was great too, because it gave us seven day production in putting up the building where we saved a lot of money. We utilized 50% union labor. We utilized 50% non-union subcontractors. You know what? They worked in perfect harmony. Why? We were there to solve the problems. Now I'd like to briefly explain the positive impacts to the community. First of all, this was built during the deepest recession since the Depression. Early on, we decided I wanted to keep all of this money in the state of New Hampshire, so I put a caveat in all the construction contracts that said, they had to achieve a 95% New Hampshire worker ratio in order to work on my side. And you know what? They did it. So we had one of the lowest unemployment rates in construction during the recession in the state of New Hampshire as opposed to the rest of the country. We ultimately ended up with an adaptive reuse and cleanup of contaminated decaying property. 
property taxes increased. Let's talk about new jobs. We had new construction jobs. We had new high-paying medical jobs. We created a whole economic engine out of a piece of contaminated land that was closed up and decaying. The Elliott Hospital, fabulous partner, great health system, provided better access and a less costly health care vehicle. We donated the best piece of land, which was the five acres along the river, back to the city of Manchester for a park. And above all, at the end, we created the fast food delivery system for health care. And the hospital managers cringe every time I say that. <laughs> Naturally, this all started with vision and getting everybody to buy into the vision. Vision, as far as I'm concerned, is a grassroots adventure. It starts with your team. If you can't sell it to the people that you're paying to believe you, who are you going to sell it to? <laughs> above, all, above all, you need to be passionate and then deliver. The less you promise and the more you deliver, the more people will buy into your vision. You know, we've talked about mindset and business with respect to its relationship to business. What about the family? How many really successful people do you know or do you hear about whose personal lives are shattered? Mindset has a lot to do with it. You can't grow personal success at the expense of sacrificing your family. It's all about the vision again. I have a beautiful wife and three great sons. My wife is a former fashion model. Now she's a licensed real estate professional and she plays an integral part in our accounting team. My eldest son, Alexander, who I think just walked into the room, attends college unbound right here at Southern New Hampshire University where he gets real-time, real-life business learning and experience. I have to take a moment and tell you about their recent success. He and four other students from the college here recently created and produced the first Enchanting Beauty Women's Expo. It was incredibly successful raising over $50,000 for their selected charities. They started with nothing got everything donated, and achieved goals strictly on mindset and willpower alone. We all told them up front, essentially, you're not going to make this. Okay, for a first-time event, it'll never happen. They achieved it. My sons grew up on bulldozers, motorcycles, bagels, and pizzas, too. When we, were in our, when we had our Papa John's franchises, we'd drop in to check things out, and they would be forced to make their own lunch. All this actually gave them, though, was actual experience as to what goes on into our business on a day-to-day -day basis. My eldest son is coming to work for the company when he graduates. But when I'm asked by people if he's coming into the business, the real answer is he's been integrated into the business from the time he could walk or talk or before. When he was born, he would sleep in a car seat on my desk, and I'd do the 5 a.m. feeding, because I was always up working anyway. The sacrifice of owning a successful company, however, and having a family flows both ways. If the family is going to buy into the vision of a successful business, you have to return the favor. I've been coaching youth football and basketball for 15 years, and all three boys have played through the systems. I haven't missed a sporting event, a play, a school obligation, or anything in that time period. If it means getting up at 4 a.m. to work, or going back to work to catch up after they go to sleep, it's worth it. Dinner is an important event in the Agnost family. We all attend. It's our mindset. You know, there are all kinds of mindsets. You can describe it any way you want. They're conventional, innovative, dynamic, static. I'll stop there. Pick a word that can describe a mindset. I guess to describe mine, you'd say it was motivated. <laughs> I'm the moron trying to squat the structural steel beam from River's Edge in this picture. Someone asked me who motivated and inspired me in my life. Well, I would have to say that every one of you and everyone I meet motivates me in one way, shape, or form. But it was my yaya who inspired me. Yaya is grandmother in Greek. My yaya immigrated from Greece. She never learned to speak English, and yet she thrived in our community. She raised eight children alone, not being able to speak English in the United States alone after my pap papu passed away early on and then raised 19-plus grandchildren of all ages in her house on a daily basis after school while our parents worked. Yaya had the greatest mindset in the world. She could achieve anything. She could make a multi-course meal out of a chicken carcass, flour, cheese, and some grass clippings from the yard. <laughs> True story. My uncles would cut the grass and pull the weeds, 
and they were not allowed to dispose of them until Yaya picked through the piles. She could party like a rock star. Actually, better than a rock star. She once drank my Uncle Billy's fraternity entirely under the table. <laughs> but even after a long night, Yaya would rise at the crack of dawn and make breakfast, or stay up all night sitting vigilant over one of her sick grandchildren. She had no formal education. My Yaya never attended a day of school. Yet she knew more cures for what ailed you than any doctor. You don't feel good? Chicken soup. That doesn't work? Uzo. You have toothache? Uzo on the gums. That doesn't work? Uzo down the gullet. The worst torture was Venduzis. Venduzis is when you take cotton balls, you dunk them in oil, you light them on fire, you place them on your back, and you put a glass over them quickly. This was to create suction to suck what ailed you out of your body. You know what? After one of Yaya's cures, you always felt better. <laughs> you were either drunk, or the disease didn't seem as bad as the cure. <laughs> Yaya had a strict moral compass. Whatever you did that she didn't like was wrong. And you were going to hell for it because you must be the devil and that's where you belonged. For discipline, though, and protection, Yaya carried two pita sticks. Pita sticks are long, thin rolling pins. And she used to carry them in her apron. She always wore an apron that had the strings tied around it. She used to carry them in apron strings like six guns. And boy, was she a quick draw. You got out of line, boom, in the head, and back in the apron strings before you knew what hit you. Everyone loved Yaya and feared her at the same time, despite her five foot, 200 pound stature. She was dirt poor, but no one, family or visitor, ever left her house hungry or without a hug and a warm smile. One day I was home from school near y the end of Yaya's life, and she had had a number of heart attacks. So the grandsons would rotate, taking turns, staying at Yaya's house overnight in case something happened. It was my term, turn, and I received an emergency call from my mom that said that she thought Yaya was in distress and I had to get over there right away. Yaya had, she had spoken to Yaya, and Yaya had said that she was having coffee with Joe Chavales. Well, the family didn't know anyone named Joe Chavales, so they thought there was a problem. So I had to run to her house. As I said, Yaya didn't speak English very well. When I got there, she was having coffee with members of the Jehovah Witness congregation from, <laughs> from Kingdom Hall down the street. She didn't understand a word they were saying to her, but she invited them in and fed them anyway. Yaya took in everyone. What really is amazing, though, is that all the grandchildren under her care have succeeded in life. We had a world-famous arranger, conductor, composer, an NFL football player, a cousin that was paralyzed in a car accident who brought about huge change for the disabled, servicemen who distinguished themselves in the service of our country. We have coaches, teachers, businessmen, philanthropists, a mentally handicapped cousin, my sister Debbie, who holds down a job every day, and all but I college graduates. Yaya valued education. This, the mindset of a poor, uneducated immigrant woman who smothered you with love and ruled with an iron fist. She created an entire generation of success in my family with her never give up, hard work, learn as much as you can mindset. Yaya didn't know a smart question from a dumb question and didn't care, she just asked it. By the way, she motivated me, const motivated me constantly by telling me what a failure I was gonna be. <laughs> she knew how to push your buttons and it all shaped our mindsets. I want to tell you in closing how much I've appreciated this opportunity to be deathly afraid of speaking in front of you today. <laughs> and as part of my usual mindset, if you didn't like it, well, I really don't give a shit. Thank you very much. <laughs>